Dun Enough fun and games. FBG Live. Friday night, and it is FBG Live Friday. Friday. <laughs> yep, man, I'm, I'm Frankie Nieto. And I'm Steve O'Brien. And like we said, this is FBG Live Friday. Okay. okay. So the big question is, um, what is Peaceful Streets, and, you know, what's it role, its role in this world, and where's it at? Well, you know, um, the way I feel is uh, Peaceful Streets is we're, we're direct action uh, media, so we're taking it straight to the streets and filming police encounters. And um, we're not here to necessarily change policy through legislation and other means. We're going direct to the source, which is directly filming exactly what's going on, putting it out there to the public, and letting the public decide. And um, hopefully through that, through the public and other, uh, you know, these public officials, and sort, we'll see some of the things that are going on, and um, we can make some changes around here. Um, you know, the public saw what's going on and what happened in Ferguson. You know, that caused a big firestorm. But, you know, that stuff has been building up. And, there's, you know, there's, there's things that happen, you know, all the time, and there's, certain, there's different levels of that. So that's, that's the, the level of – there's that aspect of it, of them, of them you know, physically – doing things on camera then there's the whole behind the scenes of them straight with the video you can see them with the police reports they lie about what's going on so it's it's also you need that to be able to corroborate your story because the police they're going to with a whole different type story in a way that's going to put you in a in a bad light so you know right right i see that we're here thing. yeah so basically we're here just here to just film what's going on we're not here to all we carry are cameras we don't carry any weapons we don't carry you know anything like that so you know so hey, let about. me ask you a question yeah. Harold hey how did you get involved in this because I know that the beginning of the story was something like you know Antonio Beeler was filming a cop from a gas station you know when those girls got pulled over and then you know they blah, 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 cuff and stuff, Antonio goes down, and then somehow out of that came, you know, um, Peaceful Streets. You know, where did you get involved? How did that happen? Because that was pretty, pretty trippy year, 2011, yeah. 2012. Correct. I mean, I mean, so these issues are things that have always been important to me, and most recently, um, you know, I, we're in the forefront of my mind. I, you know, like I said, I, I call myself a direct activist. You know, I don't consider myself an activist. I, I, I you know, I do direct action. So I, I monitor situations. I see what's going on. I see, you know, how I can help uh, things that go on. So I saw this, this situation happen with Antonio. We were friends on, um, through mutually. We were, we weren't even friends on. We were through friends through friends online. We weren't even really friends yet. So I just saw the story. And as soon as I saw it that night live what was going on and and we have mutual friends and such and as soon as it was over i heard his account of what's happened okay so then i, I read the account i was like okay that's that sounds pretty much legit i i can believe that that you know that this occurred right so right. once so then that occurs so then he was looking for a video so then i was out there you know also a lot of us you know, mutual friends on facebook were sharing the information so once through the chronicle um, he, somebody saw it, they found it, and we got the video. So once I saw the video, I immediately contacted him uh, through Facebook and said, what do you need? You know, how can I help? And um, I have a certain set of skills. You know, we can get together. 
we got friends, and, and um, I said, what do you want to do? I said, do you want to go after this issue? It, it clearly states that, that what, you know, you're being charged with contradicts, you know, what's being shown in the video, you know. Do you want to take action? And this is before, as you see him now, I saw him at the beginning before he was activist at all. He was just a normal dude. Right. In 2011, so, it was just a normal world to him. Yeah. Right. You know, New Year's he was Eve just a guy day. being a yeah. designated I driver. Mean, yeah. You right. can see the waves that Peaceful Streets has caused. Right. Yes. You know, it's building upon building. You know, right. Cop Watch and Cop Block, they, they've been out there before, but mm-hmm. then there was that thing that you guys wrote, which is, and are writing, which is Peaceful Streets. And we were just talking on the earlier part of the segment that, um, one of our lieutenants over there is doing a, a test of uh, officer camps, right? Which is a good thing, right? We should film, or the cops should film everything. And we actually are proponents of them all being live streamed constantly so we can monitor them and make sure they're not um, causing harm to our fellow man. But the only reason they're thinking about that is because, well, uh, peaceful streets exist. And they didn't really want it to uh, come about. You you recently got, uh, what is it, some paperwork back from a FOIA that you put out there? Uh, yes, yes, correct. Um, yes, there was a FOIA request uh, from Austin Police Department, So and, and we received different um, emails, internal emails, and um, a slideshow uh, presentation, and also, you know, all sorts of things and alleg- false allegations and and just it's just nonsense, you know. From it's it's certain cops that have a vendetta against us, so it's it's a personal thing with these cops against certain members. So, well, that's, I, I, that's, I think that you're fighting two fronts there. You know, it's a, it might be you know I know there's the personal aspect, but when you guys popped into existence, they were just getting used to the idea of being live streamed by the occupiers and so forth. And they resisted and they beat heads in people that were filming them and they still don't like it. We can go look at Ferguson and so forth. Uh But now the the police are all, well, maybe we should have this as well. And so you've kind of made it easier for them to wrap their head around the fact that it's for our both of our good that all your actions are monitored. Yes, I mean, that's it was concurrently going on with Occupy, and I wasn't like an official member of Occupy, but like I say, I was doing my own thing, so I was out there uh, filming and live streaming during that too, so that's why like a lot of this stuff was going on. That's kind of where I got the idea. I was following um, Tim on TimCast, and, and so these ideas, and, and then Cop Block, I already knew Pete Air. I was, you know, so these ideas were already percolating, and then once this happened, that's what we decided to do was to take this to the next level and really, you know, let's organize, let's get a big group of people and let's not only film, let's train others to film, normal everyday people that aren't even activists. That aren't Because we have, we have normal grandmas, you know, young folks. We had a, a 13-year-old that was very mature, that's out there fil- that was filming with us. We had people, old, retired, in their 60s. People that it's the first uh, activist-related thing they ever did. People that were um, Democrats, people that were Republicans, people that were from all political spectrums, no political spectrum. Um, everybody, white, black, you know, Asian, Hispanic, all age ranges, and um, so yeah, I it brought that from the first. Yeah, time. Right. There, was, there was all kinds of uh, it was, people it, there. All kinds of all, it, correct. It was all kinds of people there. So, you know, it was kind of like just, it, it was a perfect storm, and he, you know, he, he was ready to, to really, you know, fight this and champion others. We were going to, and that was the thing, use his mm-hmm. case to bring awareness to all these, because it was bad for what happened to him, but we knew of the Byron Carters and the Le- all these other ones, all these other uh, people in Austin that were shot in the back and killed and died by the hands of these and other stories right. we started getting in. And so we wanted to use his story because the media was covering it so much. It went nationwide to use that as a spring springboard to bring apart other people's stories and then to bring about change and then to educate the public and then to, you know, kind of give the public some tools to, you know, so they can protect themselves, protect the community and, 
feel safe. I mean, that's what's going on in Ferguson right now. They're they're they are using the same um, type of uh, plan we are. They're organizing. They're giving away. They raise money. They gave away about a hundred free cameras, like the first really? time we did nice. our first summit. And they're out there training people and they're caught watching. So, and I don't know if anybody's we've been in contact with them, but it's out there. But it's oh. it's spread. I mean, that's interesting. I know so they have their own of... top block going on. So, so they, are they doing a cop watch, cop block, or are they doing a peaceful streets? Do you have a chapter? It's, it's out more there? of a cop. It's a cop watch type thing. I think it's, they called it. Um, it's it's a uh, it's some cop watch. But you know, these are things that we are, you know, looking to get in contact and use what's going on now to help um, organize with others and share, you know, some of the techniques and strategies and stories and things that we've gone through because these officers that we've caught on camera that have been doing things that that make them look bad those are the ones that have came after us in numerous ways you know i i could take up a whole you know hours to go i mean it's it's ridiculous this just right well y'all really even had people y'all had a, a cop I, I forgot the uh i forgot y'all exposed him but y'all had a cop that was a uh Y'all caught that was an undercover who was trying to infiltrate the Facebook group, and he actually went on a couple of the patrols with y'all. I forgot what his name was. Yeah, there was a cop. Um, I mean, there's been there's been several. But there's one that was online named Jason Mistrick, and he was having right. issues with. Okay, there was a, there was a, there was an Austin cop watch. There were several small cop watches going on. There would be a few people, you know, very loosely based, and. This one guy, this one officer, Jason Mistrick, that worked downtown that was more of a bike cop, and, and, and if you search him online, you would see his stuff with him ha- harassing videos, harassing other bicyclists. That seemed to be his thing at the time. So there was stuff about him before we even came into place. Um, and so one night, John Bush was cop watching and filmed him getting all touchy and feely with uh, another a female in the street. You know, these, oh, these no, women get really? drunk. And yeah. see, it made them look bad. So these women get drunk, and they're all, ah, officers. And he's all hugging and, and touching on all this, this, this woman, and we, they're sitting there filming him. And it's, uh, of course he feels embarrassed, so he gets up, he walks away, and they're following him. And then <laughs> he starts tripping and starts, like, yelling and grabbing him at the, on, on his arm. And, you know, you know, don't follow me, you're interfering, all this. Then he mm-hmm. runs off. They eventually find him arresting, detaining someone, and they're filming. And they're filming, and they, he keeps telling them to get back here, get back here, and then they, he just arrests them. So then that cop from that day that that happened, um, because, of course, that video was put out, then it was Vendetta, and he started putting uh, Facebook profile links on police forms and saying that these guys are violent and da 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 about others. And then once Peaceful Streets happened and everything else happened, then, you know, we, we had others. So it's, it's, uh, it's most cops that we're dealing with, like the Barry, like this cop that wrote this whole thing about us that we uncovered in the FOIA request. Um, he was oh, the one. Tell us about that. Go he on. was one of the ones that was undercover at downtown. And um, I don't know, we'd run into him while we were cop watching a lot. Um, and okay. and out and then in his uniform, and he just had a thing for Antonio. I think he's he's arrested Antonio. He was one of the cops that arrested Antonio for. Oh cop- God! They've arrested Antonio like so five times. Yeah, how many times? Since probably this- about different things, but for cop watching, probably yeah, like four times just for that. He yeah. was one of the ones, and so. He just had, you know, like I said, the ones that you run into, they just will have a vendetta against you. So, right. Well, you faced a, a big struggle because I remember a few times when Antonio was arrested, and I, I kind of, like, went through that with you guys from a remote perspective. And, um, like, I believe he was coming home from the tag thing at one time, the Texas for Accountable Government, where he received the award for Man of the Year. And they went down, was it 13th or 16th Street filming? And they took exception to that, threw him in jail again, right? I mean, all throughout, you know, 2012, 2013, they were doing, they were using these tactics to try and stop us. Um, uh, Harassment, um, illegal detainment, 
and all sorts of things like that just in in you know in your face then you had all this background stuff like some documents that we can get a little bit later that they released that also created a background you know a false background about you that's then circulated amongst other cops and other agencies that then can put your, you know, your life in danger in other ways, you know, or have others then surveil you. So then we're under, like, hardcore surveillance, like we are a, a terrorist group, and all we're doing is filming officers and, and putting this stuff online, and we're live streaming, and you can clearly see if, if you know, if we were doing anything wrong, then there would be charges would have stuck. The charges that they did put on any of us, would have stuck. I've never got charged with anything, but the Charles Antonio, all those mostly got dismissed. And, um, you know, right. we won our court case, federal court case, that the federal judge ruled that we have the right to film, to film. And that was established at the time we were filming. And so, you know, we're, there is a class action lawsuit. Uh, I mean, not class action. There's a civil suit against APD for violating rights for all the arrests and all the steal because then they arrest you they steal your equipment they hold your equipment right you know we need you know we need their cameras we need the, you know the data luckily most of the stuff was live stream but you know right. it's intimidation mm-hmm. and and they keep it for a while you don't have yeah. it back to you at all you know right. it's like man that sucks i use that that's my equipment right <laughs> and then that's if you're lucky to get it in operating conditions back to you yeah, okay. but but we we when we were out there, you would you would see how I don't know if you ever went on a cop watch how we would change the demeanor and the way these cops would operate, especially oh, yeah. when we were out there. With we sometimes we'd have cop watch groups, thirty to fifty people, and so we would run up on a police scene, um, with surround it with like ten cameras all at once, circular wow. and. They would take people that would be detained um, for drunkness or fighting, and then next thing you know, they are being all nice to them. You know, drunk people, they, they you know, one cop was started uh, giving this, un- uncuffed them, and here comes a cop bringing this guy water, and everybody's, like, laughing and clapping. And then they just, re- they find his friend, and they release him to his friend and let him go and, uh, you know, call tabs for people. It's so funny. It's like it's an episode of Cops all of a sudden. They are yeah. the nicest, you know, but when we're not there, if we run all late, then they're they're doing their thing, you know, if we're late. But yeah, if it's we're a there, normal, res- normal procedure. So, I yeah, I don't get it, right? How are you a terrorist if you bring that much love to the world, right? If they right. actually, you know, that was a good interaction instead of this evil interaction. interaction right. Well, you see how they, they try to, like, they... I don't know if you saw that PowerPoint presentation that they put up there. That uh, I think Catherine Bleich put it up there from the uh, from the FOIA, and they have a, a picture no, of Harold putting up a flyer, right? And then in the next picture next to it uh, is a him of a I guess it's from a firework, right? Yeah. right? And then the slide before that is talking about how they the members of Peaceful Streets have training in explosives and what? have access. To and all that shit. Oh, but yeah, it's a it's from a they firework. Exp- <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah. The way the way that crazy. they you know crafted the slides. This guy, this is that Barry cop. He crafted it, and yeah, he had that. I was putting a slide up. I mean, a, a flyer up, and I was telling, you know, my wife that was taking a picture. You know, to click the camera, but it looks like I'm pointing, and then right next to it, it's a it, it's we're July Fourth thing. Our family. We went and we're and we we're in the country and and took pictures of some fireworks going off and then they put explosives. The next slide yeah. is, a, is a picture of the IRS building down here that got hit by a plane. Oh, and oh I had yep. a picture of that. And yeah. so they put down the next slide and said federal. And they put the the slides together, and the cops mind seeing this. And then also in the right up, they're writing stuff about Oklahoma City bombing and. Comparing us to Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh, right? And they you, keep it's on laughable. The... You, if you read this, you would laugh. It's so unbelievable what he's saying. Right. It's it's utterly ridiculous, and he knows what he's doing. He knows that we are not a threat at all. But in order to stop us, this is the extent that they will go to. Right. You got to create the boogeyman. 
Yeah. Right. I think he got into the game just because, you know, he was actually underneath the snowball when it was coming at him when he got filmed for, you know, flirtatious business free street. And yeah. He's gone it's different than that. Uh, sounds like. Right. You know, this guy, I mean, he's, he has been, after all this stuff was going on, and we exposed him from stalking our Facebook profiles, and um, he actually, at one of the trials for John Bush, he showed up at the trial. Well, it was, he was in the trial. It was the trial for that arrest. He walks off the podium and walks by Kat. They, they're, she's holding their newborn baby, who's probably a couple, few months old. He walks by her and just throws these papers at her. It almost hits the baby. She picks them up. It's all these printouts of her Facebook and all this stuff mm-hmm. circled and stuff. And then he walks off, and then that was the confirmation that we already knew at the time, you know, that uh, that was him, that it was wow. that cop that was doing all this. And he would, he would jump into conversations and, 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 and say things, you know, trying to provoke, provocateur, you know, violence or things against police and, 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 and to what our event. What's his name again? Is that Oborsky? Or? This one's Jason Mistrick. And his name, he had a nickname, Max Rock. That was That's the what it was, Max, Max Rock. Rock. Good old Max Rock. <laughs> Which is the name from uh, Mad Max. It's, the, it's the Mel Gibson's character in Mad Max. Yeah. Next top. So that's what he thinks. It was so evident, and when I saw the fake profile, I was trying to tell people at the beginning, which, you know, people was hard to believe. I said, man, this is an officer watch. Because he was only talking about that video and the event, and he was trying to say he was a cop watcher from San Diego, and he just moved here. But then how do you know all of us? How do you know everything about us? Right. And yeah. he was saying all – it was just strange. So, I mean, we have him, the cop that you were trying to say, Oborsky, that's the cop that arrested – Antonio, that was the cop, one of the cops that was, you know, abusing the girl. Right. That um, was he the was whole... the cop of the year. The Borsky's the one, the cop of the year, who has the killer amount of DUIs, you know, record number because they just, they just fraudulently just pull anybody over and, and right. like the He's breathalyzer. Right. They they <laughs> said that Antonio after Antonio used it, the breathalyzer was broken, the bat the Batmobile machine, but then yet all through the night they. Several dozens of other people went through it. Supposedly, it was tested, and supposedly it was drunk. They, I mean, I already had an opinion from police from encounters I had as a past, as a teenager, and and one other uh, false charges. A cop had a personal vendetta against me when I was in my early twenties. Um, put some false allegations against me that I fought and won. And I mean, it might it's kind of common knowledge, you know how crooked cops are and cops have been caught so many times but you just don't understand the level up that it's just it's institutionalized they're they're basically the whole institution's is rotten to the core the whole i mean it, if there's so-called good cops you know where are they at you know these fairy tale good cops that right. allow these things to happen they, they allow their partners to falsify reports to abuse people you know, and they sit there and turn a blind eye. So, right, it, it's, and they're enforcing victimless crimes, and they're exactly. to, they're protecting us by killing us and destroying our lives. Right. right. I write tickets to save lives. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And, hey, I don't have clarity on whatever happened to that chick that Antonio filmed. Did she take a plea? Man, um, it's you know. hard for me to remember exactly what was going on. Because ca- her case was dragging on so, lo- so long. Um, I can't... That's okay. I think everything kind of worked out with her. I can't remember exactly, you know, what happened after her, like, trying to go after. Because the next thing I think was they were going to try to, you know, sue for, you know... You know damages, but I, a civil suit. Yeah. But I don't know how how far that's going because all this stuff takes so much time. They drag it out for so long. Oh yeah, uh, trust me. Like um, here, I've had my interactions with the uh, local law enforcement here for riding with chalk on the sidewalk for uh, politics. I've I've gotten in there, parents, and man, that's that's destruction of property. That is so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. I, I was all like, I thought I owned property. it. Yeah, right. it's private property. I, was, right. I thought I paid for part of this. And exactly. Like, oh. 
Oh, and they're, uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, but I learned through those processes about how long it takes them to, uh-huh. to get their shit together. Right. And then here, like I, um, like we talked in the emails, I, I, I told you the community because there is a, this is like police apologist headquarters, man. Cop breaks your nose. Yeah. The majority of people in this area say is, oh, well, you probably shouldn't have smarted that cop. Right, and they don't care about the roof or right. dangerous job, the construction. They just go, hey, a cop just you know fell down the stairs. Let's do a fundraiser for him right. and give him millions of dollars or something like that. Oh, you know, what a- yeah, there's, there's people like that. Until it happens to them, until they have that experience, which I've, I've you know, there's a few friends of mine, you know, and others I know that you know had that same thing, that same thought. Until they're driving down the road one day and a, and a cop, you know, treats them in a bad way. And then they, they realize and they didn't do anything to deserve it. And that changes their point of view. And so some people, that's what it takes. Uh, I mean, you really, there's not, I mean, it's just being a part of this and be, I'm just, it's so, it's everywhere. It's a nationwide epidemic. I mean, Ferguson is, is, is I mean, that's why it's, it's the, the nation's, you know, was bringing this so much attention about all these issues, but these issues have been going on, you know, nonstop. And mm-hmm. and, and, and since it's a racial issue, they, you know, that that will really get a lot of press. But you know, the week before that, a white kid was killed the exact same way just because he had headphones in. And, right. Yeah, he was coming out of a convenience store. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, you you mind clarifying some um, Ferguson stuff for me? Because I'm a little bit shaky on a little bit of this. So they just released a video within the last week or so, or a picture or a statement or something like that, saying that he was standing there with his hands up when they killed him, right? Yes. Okay. And so at the beginning, they said all sorts of things, like day zero, day one, day two, they were throwing out all this counter information, right? right? They were releasing videotapes of some robbery, you know, without a FOIA request or any kind of request or anything, right? They're just like, well, here. Right. So um, now what do we know about Ferguson? That was he even involved? Well, we don't know he was involved with it. The police didn't know he was a suspect. He wasn't a suspect. They just did a normal thing where they said, I hey, think he's like guilty. That. I'm going to get this I'm going to shoot him. He's not obeying me. Or maybe, I don't know. Is it, is it that straightforward nowadays on Ferguson? I mean, basically, that's, I mean, we've seen it here in Austin. I mean, that's that's how these cops operate. If they feel, regardless of whether they feel threatened or not, that's what they'll say. They'll say, you know, I was in fear of my life. That's kind of a legalese phrase for them to get out of it. And, right. um, you know, I don't know what the motivation for the officer there is. You know, I wasn't there. You know, all I know is is that there should be uh, way better ways. If you're a highly trained, professional, you know, peace officer, should be well versed in you know tactics to de-es- you know to de-escalate situations so that all parties are you know safe and no one gets hurt. There are ways that he could approach that situation that 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 kid didn't have to die that day. I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean, no, they I have. Don't. I mean, I mean. See, the thing is, to me, this is the, the thing. This is the this is the this is what I see. They when they're supposed to use, you know, tasers, you know, they use guns. Now, not every situation they should use tasers, but some of these situations where they do lethal force with a gun, to me that's the situation you should have used your taser at because most of the time these people are unarmed and they're run, and they're running away, which is dangerous at itself with them moving. But, I mean, the situation where they use their tasers are mostly to- totally uncalled for. It's mostly that's pain compliance. Yeah. And then if, if you move, if you run, it do turn because you're fear of your life because they shoot and kill. If you do that, it's kind of like a perpetual endless cycle. Then a benefit of the doubt, they just shoot to kill. They're trained to shoot to kill. 
They're trained to empty a clip. Um, they're not, they won't um, try to just disable you so you can even talk. You can't, see, that's the thing. So we're asking about what happened with the store and all this, but he's dead now, so we don't even, <laughs> he can't see himself. So. Oh, right. hey, we just had a big yeah. internet glitch. It's storming over here. I don't know if it's storming in Austin. I, I, I heard that. Yeah. So we, we missed you for a second. So if you wouldn't mind repeating that a little bit again. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the thing is, is we don't know the true story because the cop, you know, killed him. So he uh-huh. can't defend himself. But these officers... If they're so scared in all these situations, then why are you a off, why are you a cop? I mean, that's what right. blows my mind. They're scary. If you're, why are you so scary about these situations with people that are unarmed? I mean, remember the Christopher Dorner situation? Mm-hmm. These cops were flipping out out of their mind, shooting at two little Asian women in a blue truck. Does that look like a black guy <laughs> to you? Wrong make, wrong model, what? wrong race. And they're just all, no. Shoot them. Shoot them. Just, you know? So to me, isn't that a, to me, that's the definition of a domestic extremist. What's more extreme to you? People that from a distance are filming with cameras that are transparent. You know, we're in the public. We are using our real names, you know, and – we're just sitting there filming versus these guys dressed like, you know, Darth Vader, right. with body armor, with all kinds of weapons, you know, that, that and, inflict pain and don't ask questions later, cover up themselves. And, I mean, who, who's more extreme? You know, you know they, are the, they are the domestic extremists. And the crazy, this is part, not, the crazy are, part is they, how do they get their heads around it? Some of them actually believe that they're the good guys. Yeah, it's right. it's it's that's the thing. They the twisted seeing this and being on the inside. That's what I'm saying. When when you're now on the inside and you get get a little peek at this brotherhood, the thin blue line, and how they it, you have to know. And growing up in Dallas Fort Worth in the '80s, I know about gangs and I've been about gangs. You have to look at the at the police force, law enforcement as a gang. Mm-hmm. That's what they are. And uh, they, they are the most, they're the powerful street gang that we have to deal with. And they, they stick with each other. Like these, the, the cops that know this officer, Barry, that put together this, this ridiculous report, they know this, cop's, this cop right. is ridiculous. They know he's a fool, just like, you know, you know your friends or your, or your family member, whatever. But they're going to stick up for him. The danger is, is these cops that don't know him, they're on the outside, they are just, Looking for, they think they're Jack Bauer too, and yep. so they're looking for any kind of thing going on, and they're like, oh, here's something else. Here are these guys. Here's this group, and they believe the hype because it's the thin blue line telling them. <laughs> so that's that's where the danger lies. Is hey, that? Hey, have you ever followed all those uh, Rick Reinerson and some of his posts as he's uh, going through the police boards and she's seeing some of the things that they say? I, yeah. Have you ever seen those police boards where you actually have to be a cop to get on these internet boards and you know talk yeah. stuff about I, everybody? Yeah, I've seen screenshots. I've been on pages of cop apologists, Facebook pages, uh, other forums, and yeah, when things go on or any kind of event, especially during the peaceful street stuff or whatever, yeah, it's it's, it's a crazy. whole different actually, mentality. They look at us, you know. They they don't they don't view us uh, the people you know the citizens the people of the community you know they you know they view us they're 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 scared of us they're frightened of us they're frightened they're, they're especially frightened you if you know your rights if you don't know your rights then they just are like a predator they'll just prey on you I you know it's a strange it's situation. a very vicious, vicious cycle hey Harold yeah. if you don't mind if I could bring you. Uh, back a little bit and uh, talk about the second summit a little okay. bit. You got the opportunity to uh, sit down and have, uh, I guess, dinner and a couple of drinks and hang out while you sit down as the yeah. founding members of the Black Panthers. Can you talk to us a little bit about that experience and how was it? I mean, because I knew a little bit about, you know, SEAL and stuff like that, but, you know, to have that kind of opportunity, it would be mind-blowing. Yeah, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. 
Yeah, that that was one of the most um, amazing experiences of my life. Um, you know, I felt a, 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 a soul connection with him, with his ideals, with his philosophy. Um, I feel like, you know, I am a product of, of that of that movement, of that spirit, you know, of that energy. Um it it was it was just an amazing, you know, you know, moment I had to be able just to hear him that day speak and then to later just sit yeah, and have dinner and just sit and and, and be in his presence and hear his stories and and conversate with him and, and, and hear the connections from the the past and the present, and it's just amazing uh, what they were able to accomplish without the internet, right? Without huh? the phone books, they had nation. They were able to communicate nationwide, you know, through newsletters, through mailing, through all kinds of ways. Through, they had, they had people in Hollywood. They had people in the music industry. They had people in p- places of politics. They had people. It was kind of like an underground. It's kind of like it is now because I'm just a normal dude. I'm not, and that's what I learned about him. He was just a normal guy. They were college-educated electrical engineers just like me. You know, I have a career. I have a 20-year career in, in an industry. Right. And this is what this is this is what I do. This is you know to, as my place in this world. I believe this is. This is, you know, my passion. This is, this is my place in life. This is my mission. This is, you know, this is stuff that I just feel like, you know, I'm compelled to do. And um, that's the situation that, you know, they were in. They were college-educated grads. They weren't going around. Um, you know, his dad was working for uh, NASA. I mean, the, he was an aeronautical engineer. Right. You know, I mean, these guys were highly intelligent. You know, it, it wasn't just like how they're trying to paint us as some extremists. It's, it's, noth- it, it, it's nothing like that. That's just what you have to do to discredit, you know, the truth organization, oh, yeah. the power of the organization. Um, so, yeah, just to hear the stories and, you know, the cop watching, how they did it with, uh, you know, they used, they, were, they weren't, they had weapons, they had sh- they followed the law, and in the law at that time, you could have rifles because of hunting laws. Right. Um, they could be you, they could be uh, loaded, but they had to be pointed up. You couldn't. You had to. You know that's why you saw them marching with them pointed up. You couldn't point them down, and and so you could carry rifles. So that's why they had them to protect. Because at that time, you know, kind of like now. Cops were just, it was just open season. They were just killing people left and right. And there was no recourse, similar today. And so as they were out there uh, observing the officers and they were, you know, and, you know, they were speaking their rights and they were um, reciting law and it was blowing these officers' minds because they never... Well, they probably couldn't recite the law themselves. They just right. know yeah. that they <laughs> arrest you and they figure it out later, right? Right. You know, we just sit there and I'm bringing him in. What for? I yeah. don't know. He did this, this. Okay, you just use Section 442. Yeah. That's, That's what... for... You're under arrest for resisting arrest. <laughs> he scared me. He made me piss my pants. Stop resisting. What yes. else? So, yeah, I mean, so they were – out there reciting the law and educating the community and the cops were just running, running and hiding. And, and it's funny because, you know, in situations the cops would run from us at times to, to, to get away. And, and it was just, so they wouldn't be on camera. Yes. Yeah, so they wouldn't be on camera. They'd <laughs> so run like from it, us the, the Bobby Seale era, that was at the yeah. same time that, uh, Abby Hoffman was around, wasn't it? Right. Abby Hoffman, it was um, Timothy Leary, you know. They were friends of Timothy Leary. I mean, and so all these allegations of race, so they would have, they were they were connected with um, the students for, um, it was like a lot of, uh, I forgot students for Liberty S. I, I can't remember that name of that group. But uh, that then ended up being the Weather Underground. A lot of members started that. But, you know, they had, you know, <clears throat> You know, yeah, they, were okay. in, they were integrated so, with white people. There was no racist thing going on. So blacks that would join that would, you know, be, you know, racial or what's up against, you know, 
of white, working with white members or other white activists, they would say, go down to the Nation of Islam. You know, we don't do that here. So the Black Panthers were not a black, radical, black racist. The original Black Panthers, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, that, they weren't. This new group, this Quinnell X, is nothing. <laughs> he's, not the, he, he's a fake Black Panther. He stole the name. Right. You know? And I heard that, and I already knew that, but I heard that from the mouth of Bobby Seale. Right. They I have no affiliation too. with Quinnell X. They tried to actually sue to get them from using their name. That's why they have the new in front of it, the new Black Panther Party. They are not the Black Panthers at all. They don't oh, represent yeah. their ideas. It. So don't get you know, get that mixed up. So it was hey. a nice, great, you know, conversation with him. And um yeah, it was amazing, something I'll treasure, you know, my whole life. Okay. So, um Oh God, I just forgot what it, exactly what I was gonna try to ask you about. No, I do not. <laughs> so when you got the, you made this FOIA request because I really need some clarity on this. When did you, when did you do this FOIA request? What year? What time? What did you want? What were you looking for? Well, it wasn't me. It was Antonio. Okay. And the exact details of that, I'm not sure. So I want to put out fa- uh, wrong information. But it does take several months for this to happen, and it's okay. trickle- and it started, you know, trickling out. I work a weird schedule at at night. So, I mean, I'm still digesting this, and I believe we got everything, but I'm having, we're having a conference call this weekend. And so Did we'll anything all be to surprise you at all? Um, so I mean, I study history, and I know about what cops have done in the past to activists and how they set them up, uh, the Black Panther parties, what the feds have done to them, how they infiltrate certain groups. Uh, I, I mean, all the way up to current Ocup- Occupy. I mean, um, right. so I, I'm aware of what they do, and that's something that us, you know, in this in this movement um, that we joke about about that we have that we're on a terrorist watch list, and we have we joke about these things we knew in the back of our mind, but it's just kind of confirm, confirmation of uh-huh. what I already kind of already knew. But the level that they would just take things, you know, and Hey, your your name was on a, your name was on a subject line of subject emails line. that yes. cops were throwing around. That's personal. That is where it said, and this is it. See, they know what they're doing. I mean, what, what? How would you react to an email that said, you know, this guy, this citizen, is threatening cops and their families? And that's I mean, more, families, I, really, families. You had to go there. I mean that is that is totally off base. That this is all it's so I'm you know once I gather more information and I'm probably gonna have to do now I'm gonna do my own more more detailed one and I'm probably gonna have to do a federal one and once I gather all this then I will see what kind of you know what kind of, kind of stuff legal. they've been doing to you. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It'd be interesting because you know the 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 one reason I brought up Abby Hoffman, right? So Abby Hoffman ends up pointing a uh, lawyer or something towards the uh, Contel Pro, right? Where right. They, well, everybody was knowing that they were snooping on him and they were manipulating the lives of these people around him. And what we saw today, or was it yesterday, or whenever the hell that I started getting you know, that document is I'm like, okay, so they're, they were trying to screw with peaceful streets too, right? I mean, I knew they did that with Occupy. Yeah. Occupy's already come out with their documentation. Now you're getting documentation showing how they defaced, demeaned, uh, didn't like it. Right. So here's, here's what we need to go. Where is peaceful streets going? What's the future? What about a third accountability summit? Are we skipping this year? Are we doing it again? Okay. Well, yeah, that's those are things about as far as uh, uh, where we're at with peaceful streets. We are as far as our our uh, leadership group are having. You know, we're having means to to you know talk about our immediate future and and a lot of goals and stuff we want to accomplish um, to make ourselves stronger and to strengthen our nationwide presence and take advantage of this uh, moment 
in time where the issue of police accountability and abuse and demilitarization of the police is at its at its you know at a kind of a peak. So we're kind of trying to take advantage of that. So there are still cop watches um, that have been occurring. Um, I haven't in the last year. I haven't cop watch. I've been taking a break and focusing on my family life because this has right. drained. My life, I was hardcore doing this for two years straight, and so I need time to focus on my family. And so I'm at a at an executive level handling things, and you know, in the future I might go back out there. But now I got to assess what's going on now with what these officers did were doing to us two years ago, and um, delve into that whole side of it. But um, we well, are be an interesting more- road. You know, especially for you as an individual, yeah. trying to look at what other people have, you know, been talking about you behind closed doors. It's like getting a uh, chance to access school records, public yes. school, right? Yeah, you'll that never permanent see record. Can you do a FOIA for public school <laughs> records or something like that? Right, uh, right. You're on the. Uh, it's on your permanent record and stuff. <laughs> see that? So yeah, I mean. We are planning to do more Know Your Rights training sessions and, and that will help you understand how to, you know, how to react in certain situations, to resp- how, what to respond, what to do when, when cops, when, if you get pulled over and such. And so we want to plan to do that and do more cop watch training sessions. That's, we're going to schedule to do that. So we have some stuff coming up. As far as another police accountability summit, the last one it took it takes so much God. time and money to organize something like this. Um, I don't see one happening in the immediate future um, that would be anything that we can do as a group and and be successful without stressing hey, out. Hey, it I just personally be, want to to thank you for putting on one and two. Yeah, you know, I totally enjoyed. You blew me away in one when you did the, the tactics of filming. I'm sitting there going, what the hell is this, and how does he know all this, right? You made a lot of good points about flanking, and if you have multiple cameras catching all the angles. And, you know, two was kind of like a speaker thing, right? It was more, yeah. Well, yeah, it was more about the guests, the guys that came down, the guys from Sandusky, yeah. Lee, Bobby. I was great to but meet the it was, it was cool with Harold though he, um, if I'm, I'm, I might be wrong but you were one of the key persons that were kept on emphasizing when you record on your phone or your you know whatever device hold it you know at a horizontally oh vertically. yes hold you it know? horizontal that's that's one of the biggest pet peeves I have and to this day you still see videos and even important videos that right. is you know that are vertical and you're missing stuff you know you right. want you to miss- you missed the whole point of having the camera. Uh, you correct. missed the camera to hold to get the whole view, and you're holding it the wrong way. But I remember yeah. that. That was one of the biggest things I remember about from you from the first one was that the fact that you kept on emphasizing. Now, when you do this, when you got these new cameras out here, or when you're just going to go ahead and use your phone or whatever, make sure you hold it like this. This is how you right. want to hold it because this is going to capture the whole view and the whole spectrum. And, okay, so here's another one just on that about holding the camera. And this is how you can just create length and and not – so when you're at – if you're filming a cop at a location, you're holding the camera, you know, close to your face right there, filming. And say the the cop asks you to step back a few steps. Keep your hands where they're at. Step back. Extend your arm where you were. So you could take probably like – three, four steps back, extend your arm all the way out. Now the camera is in the exact same position you were. It's just That's your body brilliant. not. I would have never thought of that. I would have moved the whole me. Like, I'm yeah. not going to lie. I would have moved all together. I wouldn't have thought about, well, I'll just hold my hand here. Yeah, <laughs> you hold your hand there and step back. So stuff like that, I right. mean, to create space. Um, but, yeah, the second, the second police accountability summit, I did another presentation and another – whole other wing because yeah everything was separate and there was stuff going on at the same time and so yeah it was it was hectic there was things i want i missed i wanted to see i couldn't because i was doing my own panels and stuff right. but i got to see it later on you know video but yeah it was amazing and the fact that you know we had radley balco there he had just came out with his book he did an awesome presentation it was awesome and then ferguson happened 
and now, you know, he has totally just blown up, you know. And we had him there, you know, a year before. And now, you know, every, he was on every, when once Ferguson happened, he was on every talk show, every morning show. His book went back, you know, on the best time, best New York Times bestsellers list. It's back number one again. And so I'm just happy to be a part of this, happy to be part of these individuals, you know, these trailblazers, you know. Well, we appreciate you for sure. Heck yeah, know. man. Uh, all the work that you do, uh, the guys, the rest of the team out of Peaceful Street Projects, that it means a lot. Like I, told, like I said, man, it means a lot that uh, I know that down the road in Austin, there's these guys that are perfecting the method. Right. And so that I always have here in my little town, I always have somebody I can go, hey, man, what's the best tactic to film the cops or... Right. If I need FOIA, what's, what is the best route to go about doing that? Yeah, that's going to be an interesting route as we get through that. But I always think about how, you know, peaceful she- the streets have shifted my life, my paradigm. You're, you know, uh, going out and do street action. That's great and all, but there's more to peaceful streets. So right. Good solution, and I, I can't wait to see where it goes. Oh, and then uh, something else, too, if... Uh, it might not. This might not be your uh, your area, but uh, I I remember that Peaceful Streets used to do a podcast every Wednesday. Yeah. And the last one was you know from the Second Accountability Summit, and it was John and, and uh, Radley. Uh, do you know anything of that kicking back off, or if? Uh, well, that's something that you know maybe we you know that that will maybe be discussed, especially you know if there's a demand, especially if if you know there's. The, the local Austin chapter, we get it back um, going and everything's going, then, you know, that might kick up. Yeah, John Bush was doing that, and he just started, uh, you know, doing another, uh, hey, he went on another, right, another he's project. Got sovereign living. Yeah, uh, he's got his hands Farmer full. market. Yeah, that guy's all over the chain. That's right. <laughs> right. So... There's just a lot, yeah, there's a lot to be done. That's why we're asking, you know, we're trying to find new volunteers. We're trying to, you know, also we have to vet people and because, I mean, so then this stuff that's going on that's like, that I see and uh, see, I was getting weird messages. I was having people come at me strange. I had, I had, I had people threaten me. I, I had a uh, black radical, basically black racist come at me weird around this time, around that time. I had all kinds of weird, you know, stuff going on in my life. Whenever we were exposing cops, I would just start getting bombarded with weird things. People would call my house, um, call my wife and breathe on the phone. Really? Um, I had a lot of weird stuff going on that, you know, people don't even know about. You know, being followed home. Antonio had a lot of stuff followed home. Um, We'd go, we'd get done from cop watching, we'd go back to our vehicles and there would be a cop parked right by our cars, just there all night. And our cars would be by themselves. We're off by ourselves because by the time, at the end of the night, when you're there at 3, three 4 in the morning, there's nobody, there's nothing there but you and your car. And then there's just a cop parked in that parking lot. So we would just have to follow each other where we went, follow each other home sometimes. You have to film yourself driving home because, you, I mean, you never you knew. You never know when they were going to come out and get you. Come yeah. out. And it's evident that they were after us because we see it in these reports now. So right, it's okay. it, it so was with the, the mass surveillance that's crazy. going on. And I hate to distract you a little bit, but we're we're talking about the cutesy FOIA stuff. Um, do you think that it's impossible or probable that we can get every single phone conversation that you've had in the last two years from the government? Think that they well. We know that they're monitoring all phone calls. They're monitoring all internet activity. They may not give you that information. It's highly possible, at least in my eyes, that every call that you've made, every you know communications you've done, has been monitored. I mean, I mean, I know there's definitely weird stuff going on. I don't know if they would ever you know release that type of information, but. I mean, whenever me, me and Antonio, it's hard for us to talk on the phone. We we really we talk on the phone, but we let's just say we don't. We have to use other words. We can't even talk because it's whenever we talk, 
you hear there's weird clicking and weird noises, and I mean, yeah, we're clearly our communications are under surveillance. I wouldn't say as much. I hear stuff all the time, but definitely when I'm communicating with him, it's yeah. weird. Whenever we have meetings, we would have meetings at Brave New Books or at coffee shops or all the different random places sometimes, and I would tell him to stop talking about this stuff, even in groups, because there would always be there would be an unmarked cop car somewhere, that a cop would show up, there would be cops that would, that was, you know, there was one cop stalking Antonio that was basically... He would tell stuff to his face that, you know, I'm going to get you. I'm about to get wow. you to, his, to, you know, out to her face. Man. So it, it, it was, you know, at that time. And so that kind of had, that's another reason why I just kind of, and then like internally there was, there was stresses going on. There was external stresses, internal stresses. Right. And like I said, a lot of weirdness going on that was starting to surround me, like, people that were provocateurs or weird. So I had to just kind of stay, but t- take a step back because I could feel that a setup was happening, especially with what this, the basis of this email subject line is the fact that they're trying to say I was organizing a rally or some kind of thing at this cop's house, which is totally right. yep. false. That never was my idea. I'm totally against any of that because I know that that's a setup, that's a setup waiting to happen. Because all they would have to do is send somebody there to do something bad, and then we're there, and then blame us on it. All somebody had to do is do something to his house, throw something at his house, or do anything, and then blame it on us. So, no, I, that would never be something I would do, nothing I would ever put out there, you know. So, it's strange that that idea that was put out by people that weren't even peaceful streets then is attached to me. So, you know, there was, you know, shenanigans going on, and I could feel it. So I had to kind of take a step back for a while. And we can respect that, and, it, you know, and we each get to that moment in time. It's a marathon. Right? Yeah, man, it's it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Right. Well, um, Harold, we're approaching the top of the hour, man. Uh, I would just like to say uh, really appreciate the fact of you coming in and responding to our email, uh, coming down and talking PSP with us. And giving us some insight, man. That was that was really cool. Hopefully, this is the first of many times we get to sit and talk. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, that sounds um, great. Now, before we leave, uh, is there you want to give out some more? Uh, we did the promos, of course, of the peacefulstreets.com, uh, peacefulstreetsproject.com, where people can find out more about the peaceful streets. Is there anything else you would like to throw out there for our listeners? Well, I would say, um, you know, you can check us out on uh, Facebook at Peaceful Streets Project. Um, So that will be where a lot of current information would be posted. If you want to, if you're in Austin and you're interested, or even anywhere outside uh, of Austin, if you're interested in starting your own Peaceful Streets Project group, or if you have your own group and you just want to get some tips, get some help, you can contact us through email. That information is on our website. You can contact us through Facebook. It is hard to, you know, get back with everybody, but, you know, we're, we're, that's another thing. We're trying to get better at doing that and get, put people in places to handle this influx because we've been getting a lot of influx of, uh, of questions and help and for training and for this and that. So I'll look into that. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Check check the Facebook groups because the latest information about this scenario will be posted there. And I, and the future of this, I really don't know because we're just now finding about it. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that that uh, as as this moves forward, that you know we will gather more information and you know we're gonna take steps, you know what we can, you know against this. So you know please I. I, I I'd like to thank everybody for the support out there, um, and I'd like to thank you guys for having us, having me on the show. Yeah, man, and you changed the world. Yeah, man, you yeah. changed. The and world. just know that uh, PSP always has a friend with FBG Live. Yeah. We always have your backs, regardless. Um, we even we even we even have decided as a as a company that. Uh, once we get our campaign going, our Indiegogo and our Kickstarter, all that stuff going, that uh, uh, 
part of our proceeds or the donations that we get will go to PSP. Yes, because yeah. oh. that's that's our heart, man. Is is the accountability? Y'all are doing so much to help try to at least hold the system accountable. You know, if if we have to live in a system, at least somebody's trying to hold it accountable. Right. You know. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, that's that's an awesome gesture. Yeah, we're. It's up to us, you know. It's it's up to us to do it, you know. That's that's the way I, I live my life. That's the way I believe. Uh, you know, I've always been a type of person to stand up for others, stand up for the little guy, stand up to these bullies, and that's kind of the situation we're in. And and um, not every this is not for everybody, so I understand that. I understand that everybody can't do this, be out there, because it's. It's kind of scary out there with these guys. Some of them have been oh. murderers. They've killed people. And it's, uh-huh. it's, it, to be out there to face this, you know. So, yes, if you want to, the way that you can support is support us is by, you know, donations. There's donations to, uh, like I said, there is a lawsuit that's happening. There's links to lawyers on Antonio's uh, site for his case. And you can just put the word out. Protect yourself, you know. Whenever you, whenever if you see somebody pulled over, if you have the time, if you are aware, if you are with other people, film from afar. Take your camera out. Film what's going on. You never know. You might save someone's life. I mean, we had to go back and oh, think yeah. about Rodney King. That was before anybody thought about this. Oh yeah. And, I mean, that's that is that's the beginning. Mm-hmm. And everybody thought everything was changed once the Rodney King video came out. It has changed. Boy, it, it, it changed. It got a lot worse. It got a lot worse, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's what that's what I would say out there. You don't have to be a, 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 a peaceful streets member. You don't have to be at the level we're doing. Just observe. Just look. Pull over and look. Watch, and, and, and you might be the one to save someone's life. You know of what's going on, and 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 yourself. Think about. If you get pulled over, pull out your phone, turn on the camera, put it in a way that it can film what's going on. Put some in your vehicle that, that will allow you to do that. If, you have, if you're bold enough, actually hold it and film. You have the right to do that. I've done that. You know, last time I got a, a pulled over for a speeding ticket or whatever, I filmed the whole thing. You know, I, I rarely get pulled over. I, don't, I, don't, I try to do what I can not to have any interactions. But if I do, I'm always filming. If you're not filming, you're recording the audio. At least you'll have that. But at least, hey, are you still using five one two thirty four Unite? Yeah. What happened to that? Is that still an active What's going on? Um, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure if that's uh, going on now. I mean, I haven't. I haven't used that in a, to be honest, in a while. Um, but I don't know. That number should still work unless something has changed with it. Yeah, but um, you know, like I said, these, right? These these are some things that you know we're going to address, and I'm sure, like, and in in now that there's probably other new solutions that we, new technical solutions that we can implement that can kind of create the same type thing. But yeah, we're just you know, protect yourself. If you, you know, don't you never know what's going to happen if if. If you are filming or at least recording situations, you will have it there in, in case you need it. Because guarantee, cops, they lie. They lie all the They're time. Liars. And you never know what's, how the situation is going to escalate. You don't know what's on this cop's mind. You, you have no idea. So, you know, I would just say protect yourself. All right. Good protect course, others. Man. Thank you, Harold Bray. Yeah, once again, thank you, Harold. Thank you, Peaceful Streets. Man, uh, like I said, uh, we'll be in touch, and hopefully, thanks for coming on, Harold. Thank you, guys. In fear, not your chance will draw. I must cut clean. I gotta take the elevator to the